Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I'm your host, Brett Gilliland, and today I've got the privilege to interview Dana Childs. Dana, how you doing? I'm good, Brett. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. I, I told you I'm a little nervous. I've got what I call the peanut gallery here. I've got my wife, and I've got two of her friends, uh, Natalie and Mallory, here uh, with us in, in we call our studio, which is aka my office. So we're going to have some fun today. They listen to you on The Goop, I think, is the podcast that you were on. Yes. And uh, Natalie sent it to my wife, and then my wife sent it to me, and I said, hey, I'm going to get her on the podcast, and we're going to have some fun. You ladies are going to come in, and we're going to have a great time doing it. And here we are. You said yes. So I said you yes. You are an uh, energy healer. You're a speaker. I wrote down here, you listen. You offer power to change perspective, lives, and corporations, and that's what you're doing. So thanks for being with us today. But yeah, thanks for having me. This is fun. Absolutely. So I always do on every show, Dana, is just kind of the maybe the background. So before we dive into what you are an expert at doing, but maybe what's the background? What's helped make you the woman you are today? You know, it's, it's, that's a great question. I think that everything we experience makes us who we are. And when I look at my experience, what steps up for me or what really comes to light is I was a public school teacher for about seven years and um, I did inner city schools in North Carolina and it really um, shaped my perspective on what's really happening in the world, you know, the, the conditions that, that, that are really prevalent. And it gave me that ability to, you know, stock my tool bag, as I say, with um, teaching and planning curriculum and, and engaging with other people. And then I shifted into banking and I got, I got my master's in education and leadership the same time I started a new job in banking. And I did, I was in the mortgage industry and I was in finance and i worked my way up that. And I was in, um, I did marketing and I did relationship with relationship building for the bank. And it started sort of chipping away at my soul. I, I really just didn't, I didn't like it. I wasn't liking my life. And I absolutely gave up everything I owned and everything I had. I sold my house. I sold my car. I actually rehomed a dog at the time and wow. packed a backpack and bought a one-way ticket to India. And I traveled the world for about a year and a half, figuring out who I was, what I was meant to do before I came back to Charlotte. And a friend asked me what I'd learned and I showed him. And then by the time I, by the time I knew it, I had people just calling me for, for, for help. That's amazing. Yeah. So one way ticket to India. One way ticket. You, I'm assuming didn't have any friends over there. You didn't know anybody. Didn't know a soul. I would go weeks at a time and not talk to another person. It was, it was powerful. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of questions on that. So how do you, first, I guess, how do you walk away from being a teacher, right? So you have, you know, guaranteed income, you've got this pension, you've got all this stuff and, and you, you kind of muster up the courage, if you will, to, uh, walk away from that and to go into the finance industry. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting being a teacher in North Carolina is a really low paying, difficult job. And I loved the kids. Like that's what I really enjoyed. And I was getting my master's in administration leadership at the same time. And so I was studying what theory is behind how it should look, what it should happen, what, what should be, you know, going on in the school system and was seeing the vast difference in what was actually existing. And when I would escalate and say, oh, I can help with this, or I can do this, or maybe we can implement this, I was getting shut down and I was becoming a, a problem. And you know, it, it was too much right. to kind of overtake. And I, I became really unhappy in that dynamic because it, was, it wasn't shifting or changing and I wasn't able to implement change. And then I had a problem with my mortgage and I had gone in to have the problem fixed. The bank kept drawing money after that mortgage had closed. <laughs> so, so when I went That's in, the, no, it wasn't good. And the man who was doing it said, oh, here's the help number called the help desk. And I said, That's a great suggestion. I'm going to sit here and we can call the help desk together. I'm not leaving until it's fixed. <laughs> and, and he called. He was like, okay. And we sat there and worked through the problem. And at the end of it, he said, I would love to hire you. And I said, to do what? And he said, to do mortgages. And I said, right. I teach English. I don't even add. I don't, I can't do math. And he said, you'd be great. If you want a job, you let me know. And I kept right. his card. And at the end of the year, I knew I needed a change because I was becoming really unhappy in a system I couldn't shift. And I called him and I said, I'm, I'm ready for a job. Do you still have it? And he said, no, but I'll make one for you. Holy smokes. And I, he created a position and I learned finance and I dug in and I, 
I learned the mortgage industry and we were, we were number one in the country at the time. That is amazing. So one of the questions that these uh, amazing ladies here uh, yeah. came up with, and I'm going to dive right into it, is one of the questions is going to ask at the end, but I think what you just said there is, I'm using air quotes here for those listening, is the it factor, right? You hear that yeah. back in the day, you hear Simon Cowell on like whatever it was, American Idol say that it's the it factor. You can't understand it. You can't explain it, but you just know it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that person in the, in, the, in the mortgage place saw an it factor in you so the question is, how do we recognize the passion within us that we can't really even articulate? Well, I think it's not even recognizing it, it's connecting to it. And I think what we first connect to with the passion and the it you know, within us is that it's not there. I think we feel when it's not there. And when it's there, I think we're so in the flow, we don't even, other people feel it. We are not really cognizant of it, but we recognize if the passion's missing. And when we recognize that, then it's about connecting into our heart and finding what lights us up. And we often find that by looking at what, what doesn't light us up. So how can we clean out and clear out what is taking up space, what is making us unhappy? And then we start to gravitate toward what does make us happy. And when we're really connected from the inside of who we are to what our passion is, when we allow ourselves to find that, everybody has the it factor. It's not something that you're born with or not. You know, we talk about charisma, but I think, I think it's a natural deep connection to self as, hmm. as well as charisma. So would you, what's the process for that? Because you, you don't just, not everybody has the, uh, I don't even want to call it a luxury, but I guess the courage and, and uh, the spine that it takes to take, yeah. sell everything and get a one-way ticket to India and just go find that it factor, go find that passion. Yeah. For those of us that can't do that, how do we, what's the process like to go find our passion? Well, I think, well, let me answer that in a couple of ways is one, I think that it can come about two ways. It can come about from this recognition that you really want more in your life and you, and you're willing to kind of chase after it and figure out what it is. I think it can also come from hitting a bottom place where you're so despondent and in despair and sad that you're willing to walk away from anything you have. And, and, you know, for me, it came about, I remember in high school, I had a very progressive science teacher in this very small Georgia town. And we had a, a classmate who had committed suicide. And it was really tragic for the town and the, and the school. And I remember sitting in class and he said, I can't even teach you today, but I wanna say, why would you, if you're that unhappy, why not just run away? Why take your own life? Just run away. Like at least you would have your life and then you could figure it out. And it always stuck with me. And so at this point in my life, when I did give up everything, it wasn't because I had the it factor. It was because I was so depressed and sad and I didn't know why. I just knew my life felt messy and horrible that I was willing to give it up and walk away. And, and just go, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'll be flipping burgers at a restaurant. Maybe I'll teach at another school overseas. I'll do whatever. I just can't do this anymore. And I remember my dentist, because I am, I am all about having your teeth cleaned every six months. <laughs> I just think that's really important. Yep, so, important. So I went to the dentist and, he, and I was telling him what I was doing. And he said, aren't you terrified? And I just said, I'm more terrified of staying here and feeling this way. So I think that we can bottom out to where there's such fear of living in a, in a, with a certain feeling that we start to find that passion. And I think we can get so flatlined that we want something different. And then, you know, we can do the, the luxury, if you say, or, or the, the willingness to kind of take that time and, and rough it for a while to figure it out or to create a big change. But we can also do little changes. We can also look around our, our residents and go, okay, I don't know what I'm passionate about, but I know that I don't like looking at these things that are sitting on my bookshelf. I don't like looking at these clothes that I don't wear anymore. Yeah. I don't like the person I'm in relationship with, or I don't like the way the relationship feels. So maybe we need therapy or maybe we need to read a book together, or maybe we need a date night, or maybe I need a new partner, or maybe it's looking at the little things. If we don't do big change, it's looking at the little bitty things that we can change or the little steps we can take to get us one step closer to what that passion is. We're not going to go to the peanut gallery right now for anything on that because we okay. don't want to talk about any of our issues. You know, we're all perfect, right? No, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding, of course. But you're right. I mean, about the change. I think sometimes people do have to hit rock bottom to make a change. And, and yes. I think back to Julie and I's life in 2014, I needed a change personally, professionally, right? Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. uh, at a previous firm and, and I always tell people like, why would you walk away from that? Like as income is rising, 
my job satisfaction was going the opposite Declining. direction. And yeah. um, at that time, I think we were 35 ish and, and, you know, Julie was eight months pregnant with our fourth child. We had just built a brand wow. new home. And I remember we were staying in our, in our bedroom and she said, is, is to, is now the right time? And I'm like, Nope. I'm like, it's a terrible time, but it's never a right time. Right. And I think so many people look for the right time and there isn't a right time. You just got to sometimes take the plunge and do it. Yeah. I think you're a hundred percent right. And was she supportive of you during that time? She was. And now I'm going to get like all red faced because she's right here. But and I would say that too. And we talk about that in our firm, the most successful people in most industries, but especially in our industry are the ones that have the biggest support system at home. A hundred percent. He was a hundred percent behind me, even though when I look back and I remember many nights staring at my ceiling thinking, what am I doing? I remember her always supporting. She's like, you're going to do great. You're going to kill it. You're going to crush it. You're going to be there and it's going to be awesome. And so we need that. And when we're doing something that's terrifying and we go, this is the craziest thing I've ever done, right? right? You know, quit my job when I'm expecting a fourth child or give up my whole life when I have everything people think they want. It's, I had my dad, my dad was my support during that time. And I remember going to him and saying, I hate my life. I I just, I'm so depressed. And he said, well, what are your options? And I had made a list of 10 things I could do. And it was, you know, one of them was, um, enclose my garage and learn massage and which I hate massaging people. I don't know why I thought that was a good idea, <laughs> right. right? Or open idea. a yoga studio. It was an idea. I had all these things. And then the last thing, cause I was so frustrated is I wrote down, just give up everything and travel the world. And when I read that, my dad listened to me and he goes, wow, your face light up when you said that. And I said, yeah, but dad, that is insane. Like I have everything people think they want. And he said, yeah, but does it make you happy? And I said, no. And he said, just do it. He's like, do it. It's stuff. If you want the stuff back later, buy the stuff back. It doesn't matter. And to have that support in that moment, to do some crazy thing, right? That's what matters. So I think if, if as well, if we're looking for our passion to maybe make sure we have one person in our world who really can support us or believe in us when we don't know what to believe in or how to believe in ourselves can make a key difference. So t- uh, just spend a little minute on that. What was your dad's background? I mean, for him to tell his daughter, yeah, it's, it's great. Buy a one-way ticket to India. Like most people would not say that. No. And my mom certainly didn't say that. My mom was mad at my dad for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. We're not speaking again. Yeah. We there were, energy there was for that. A little stressed. Right. My dad's background was, you know, both my mom and dad grew up in, in poverty in Southern Georgia. And, um, and I grew up in poverty too, but, but in poverty in Southern Georgia. And then they, um, you know, he had this, like he went into the military and he got the GI bill and all he knew was that he loved football and he walked on a football field one day after coming back from the army. I think he was driving a delivery truck and he said, I love this. I want to coach. I want to help you guys. And they said, are you kidding? You need to go to school and be a teacher and then you can coach football. And he's like, okay, I'll do that then. And so on the GI Bill, he went to school and he became an educator. Hmm. And my mom was jealous that he was making new friends. And so she went to school to become a teacher. Wow. Yeah. So they, was, they, like, they kind of leveled themselves up and got an education and became educators. And so the, his background was he was a, you know, a, a football high school coach and teacher for you know, 25, 30 years. And then he got into administration. So when I went to high school, my dad was the um, assistant principal in charge of mm. male discipline at my high school. <laughs> male discipline. And you're I did not date. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, <laughs> I did not date. Right. It was horrible. Yeah. But Nobody but, wants to date that girl. Nobody wants to date that girl. Everybody wants to tell them how horrible their dad is. But it was, it was that, like, his life was, you know, relatively normal, you know, I want to say small, even if it's not the right word. Um, life. And, and he just, he even said that day, he said, if I could do it differently, I would do it differently. Yep. And do you think that that's the reason you follow that path is sometimes we get in the path, right? Of just, Hey, I'll do whatever my parents think I should do. And I don't listen. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, So how do we deal with past issues that may be holding us back? Right. Whether it's, we were at a something a long time ago, Jill and I both, there was like this consultant that came in for a business side, but he said, your past gives you uh, gifts and wounds, I think is what he said, right? Mm-hmm. Our parents give us gifts, they give us wounds, our past, whatever it may be, th- those things happen. And so how do we overcome that stuff and how is it holding us back right now? Yeah, so, okay, this is such a loaded question. There's so many different ways yeah. to go with it. 
Because our past informs us, but like if we look at parents, right, family of origin, every issue we currently have, we can trace back to childhood. And I know that sounds really insane, but it's really true because zero to six, zero to five, zero to seven, those years are so formative. Yep. And everything's kind of nailed in. And then we have to spend our life really not healing and finding who we are. Healing is really finding out who we're not and what we're not. And so our past, we've shaped ourselves as to who we think we should be or who we had to be to be safe in a situation. Um, and, and we're unshaping, right? We're unbecoming is, is how we actually become. I know that sounds kind of odd, but yeah. we unbecome to become. And, and I think our past really informs us, but to go and heal from those wounds, it is what, what healing is about. And it is how we do come into our passion as well. We look at, you know, what triggered us, why it triggered us, and then how we want to really live wholeheartedly. Yeah, I think I like, so you said healing is finding out who we are not, right? And so I yep. think that's, uh, most people don't think that way because we, we try to just stay positive and stay active and think, okay, here's who I am and I'm just going to have the grit and the determination to make it happen. And we try to almost force it, right? Right, right. But, but we have to tap into this, I call it emotional courageousness, like a fierce courage around going back and looking at the past in terms of what didn't work or how you showed up that you don't want to do again or parts of you that you would not like to move forward. And we, there has to be this fierce courageousness and the ability to hold that emotional self intact so that you can heal all that stuff. You know, I always say in my work, when I'm working with clients, the red flag for me is when someone says, you know, my childhood was great. That's the biggest red flag. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to push it. We're going to ease our way in there because when that happens, we're protecting our child self from feeling whatever needs weren't met. And what we know as humans, we can't possibly unconditionally love and meet every need all the time. It's not possible. You know, I think that we have children and I think of, you know, of our parents, we are children and we choose these parents to kind of mess us up in just the right way so that we will develop our, our gifts and our self and, and our passions so that we can overcome whatever we need it. So if we're the child of, let's say an alcoholic, then we're gonna develop control tendencies and we're gonna develop you know, shut down emotional tendencies and we're gonna develop the ability to foresee what could happen that could be dangerous, right? And so those can serve us, but what we have to outgrow when we're older, those past wounds, is we have to embrace the gifts that that developed in us while then moving into how to be more vulnerable, how to, how to be able to relax and need less control and have more trust. I like this. So how, how are you doing that? Because especially for a male, right? So I'm, I'm surrounded here by the four women, including you. And so right. I'm the only male in the room, but a male is not normally going to say, yeah, I've got this issue or I've got that, or I need to work on that. How do you, how do you do that? Like, yeah. so how are you helping clients and corporations around the country? So, well, it really depends on the individual. Um, and, and it's interesting that you bring up males. And we, we agree in our society to this belief that males and females are so different. But actually, males really crave intimacy as much as, if not more than, females. And what we've taught males is it's not okay to go down the emotional path. It's not okay to have feelings. You don't talk about it. You just got through it. And we also teach some females that. And we teach females to do that in business. Right. which takes us away from the emotional intuitive connection to not only our business, but to our colleagues, to our supervisors, or to our employees. And in waking that back up, when we have the emotional capacity, we're starting to feel the intuitive pulses around us. What does the world really need? What's the product? How to market it? All of those things are really intuitive as well. And in business, right? If, if you have a man and you're like, well, how do we open men up to that? How do we get them more comfortable with emotion? Well, if you have a man who's successful in business, it's because he's reading energy. It's because he knows what someone's thinking, how to pitch something. Hmm. How, so it's the same skills. He's just bucking it out differently. Here. Are yeah. they? They're laughing. <laughs> they love this. <laughs> I think I was convinced. I think I was, this might be a therapy session. I don't even know. Am I paying for this? You don't have to pay for this. <laughs> I don't have to pay for this. <laughs> no. Yeah. I think this is reverse psychology somehow. It just happened. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I'm sorry, Dana. No, I mean, I think, you're, I think you're on it. I think it's really allowing the male the space yep. to have him tap into what he feels because he's already feeling it. 
right? You're yeah, already yeah. feeling it. Scary mm -hmm. to articulate sometimes, right? Would you yeah, say and I think scared most? of that reaction because you see, if we trace back to, um, let's say World War II. So pre-World War II, the men were home working and the women were often staying home, right? And so the men were raising the boys, raising them to be men. Here's what you do. Right. And then the men went off to war and the women had to step into the workforce, which meant the women also had to then raise the boys because the men weren't home. Now, men raise boys to be men. Women raise boys to please women. Hmm. So we have hmm. all of these boys that right. were raised to please women. And then we had the, the 70s roll around. So we had another war. We had more women in the workplace. And then we have these generations of men who are raised to please women, but don't know how to connect into that male heart to know and say, here's what I want. And we've then trained women, which I'm not saying is wrong, right? To right. be more forthright about what they want. And as a little bit of that has been done at the cost of the male voice, because at the same time, the male males learn to give up their power to please the woman's learning to take power to exert herself in the workforce. And those two things are clashing. So to come back into balance, it's realizing that men have to be men and know how to say what pleases them. A lot of times when I'm working with couples in relationship, because I love that kind of work, I see that the men will go, okay, that sounds good. Or they won't speak up when they're wanting to really say that they don't want to do something or that that doesn't feel good to them because they've learned that they just need to keep the woman happy at the expense of their own happiness. And then that fuels resentment. And then there's a disconnect and a chill in the marriage or the connection or the partnership or the relationship. And so women want men with a voice. They want men to be connected, to be able to say what they're feeling. So is that the old saying, happy wife, happy life? That doesn't, that doesn't fly in your room? It doesn't really fly in my room. <laughs> No, mm -mm. Well, I'm raising wife. four boys with my wife here. So, oh. uh, and well, one of them said the other day we were talking and I think it might've been Asher, our five-year-old. He said, daddy, happy, what do you say? Happy wife, happy life or something like that. Right. <laughs> right. Was pretty funny, but. So, but it's interesting because it kind of lets you know what the dynamics are in your family. Right. And like, and, and I also think, so this is a little aside, right? This is a freebie for you. Okay. I think that when as a couple or as a, as a parent, we have the same sex of children, or if you'll see in families, they have the same sex of children. Yeah. Right. So you have four boys, right? My parents had three girls and now five grand girls. Oh my goodness. It's and right. And my poor dad was a coach. So, <laughs> so it's, it's that idea of there's clearly something in the feminine that needs to be healed. So when you have four boys, there's clearly something in the masculine that needs to be healed. So I would say, how do you teach your boys to really focus on how they feel and how to express that in a solid male way? So everybody is in the Gilliland therapy session here <laughs> on the Circuit of Success podcast. This is great. I'm glad I am transparent and vulnerable and uh, self-aware, I think. <laughs> Maybe I'm not, but uh, you are. We all well, are. how important is self-awareness and self-responsibility when you hear those words? Uh, Cause again, coming from the male, especially in the business world, right? You don't mm -hmm. want to be this, you know, we were in a meeting today with our entire executive team sitting here in my office and you know, there's, there was uh, you know, not issues, but just things we were discussing and half the room believed it and half the room, you know, thought something different. And right. so we were having a nice discussion and thankfully we have a very transparent team. But oh, if somebody's nice. not transparent, how do you become more transparent and be more self-aware? Yeah. So I, self-awareness and self-responsibility, those are my two big platform soapboxes. You know, people will come to me and they'll say, I want to be developed as an intuitive. And I'll be like, great, let's start with self-awareness. If you don't know your own energy and your own self, you're not going to be able to accurately read someone else's. Right. So, so it's all 100% that. And when I go into corporations, one of um, the talks that I do that's like a crowd favorite every time is opening up, because I love to mainstream spirituality and I love to sneak in intuition and, and make it really sort of broad where people don't recognize what they're getting, but it's yeah. how to trust yourself in, you know, in business. And it's all about how your body will give you answers every time. And so to learn that self-trust and intuition by simply listening to your body. And I can walk a, a, a corporation through an exercise where they can have a clear cut takeaway as to how to hear their body when they're in meetings, when they're in negotiations. So they can feel what's right, what's wrong. They're making decisions for the company. They can feel what's right, what's wrong. Yep. 
And I think too, this is one of the questions that ladies had was, I think I'm reading this correctly, but what, you know, what ways should ego and intuition be used in the business matters? And the way I heard that was, how do you trust your gut versus going with the intuition uh, of just, well, I guess those are kind of the same things, but like, how do you just trust your gut and just make it happen versus, you know, having to have like a spreadsheet about it or something? Well, so I think what I love, what I love is when we marry the two together. Right. I think that we marry information, especially in business. We want to marry the, you know, I want the spreadsheets and I want the data and I want to take that and I want to then sit with that and recognize it all and have information about it. And then I want to run all that through my intuition. Hmm. So I think that they have to be joined, just like I think the Eastern and Western worlds have to be joined. I think that, you know, Eastern medicine is very um, effective when it's joined with Western sometimes or Western right. diagnoses. I think that they're, it's marrying both of them together is important. So how do we tap into that energy? So if, if I have an energy or even say there's a day that I wake up and maybe I'm a little tired or I'm just kind of in a bad mood. I mean, how do we tap into that positive energy versus just saying, Oh, Brett, be positive. Right. And, and I try to do that a lot, but it, it, how do we, how do we do that and be better at it? Well, I think there's two things. First, we have to give ourselves permission because if you say tired or I'm kind of, you know, grumpy and then you're saying positive. So you're assuming that tired isn't positive or you're assuming that grumpy isn't informative. Mm -hmm. And so it's going, oh, I'm tired. What is my body trying to tell me? Do I need to rest today? Like it's taking the information from it rather than making it wrong. So we've learned in society that happy, bliss, you know, content, these things are positive and sad, angry, upset. These things are, are negative and we want to be in the positive. So then we ignore those sadder or what we call negative emotions. We tend to discount them. That is our intuition. Our body and our emotions are and they inform our intuition they are our intuition right. so if you can go oh i'm grumpy okay let me sit with it am i grumpy because i just didn't get enough sleep am i grumpy because maybe i'm i'm feeling something that's uncomfortable am i angry because someone you know infiltrated a boundary am i angry because i need a new boundary that i'm not setting up so our our emotions aren't good or bad they're just informative they're information and when we start to look at it like that then we stop judging what we're feeling and we start honoring it. And that becomes a very different way of living. Yeah. So what is your process personally like? So you said boundaries there. I like that. That is, do we need to create a new boundary? Do you, do you have a process for that? Is there a journal that you use? Is it time you built into your calendar? What's that look like? Yeah. So for boundaries? Yes. You, know what you mean? Oh, this is like, I think there's so many different ways to do it. And currently I'm working on boundaries and my current, so I think everybody's work's going to look different. My current boundaries looks like how am I managing my schedule and how am I allowing myself to say no instead of feeling like I need to save everybody, right? I agree with that, not to interrupt, but I mean, I think yeah. this year I've been really focused on the power of no. Yes. I've even told Julie that. It, you know, you get pulled in a million different ways with my role and it's, it's, you have to learn what's the most important thing. So I've never looked at it and defined it as boundaries, but it is, it, it is. being okay with saying no and being okay of letting somebody down, unfortunately. A hundred percent. And working with that emotion of being able to feel someone disappointed and, and not think that you need to do something different. Right. But that idea of boundaries, I think that it's so important in everything. And I think everything is different. So I think that when we feel angry, that is right there. It's about boundaries every time. Right. It's about boundaries. Who's crossed a boundary that I had? Where do I not have a boundary that I need? Right you know, where am I, where am I being, my boundaries are being bullied through that is, is information. And when we do boundaries, I think they come in all different ways. So it's like, do I have boundaries around me? Is my house safe and secure? Do I have boundaries around me in traffic? Do I have boundaries around me by saying yes or no? Is my time really my time? Am I right. having boundaries? Am I taking work home? Am I doing that too often? Why am I doing that? Because then when you get into the self-awareness around why you're not having boundaries, then you start dipping into like, is there self-esteem tied up in it? Is there fear tied up in it? And then you start to do this personal work. So it frees you up to have more boundaries. I think what I'm learning too is, and I've said this for years, I, I use the uh, acronym ADT, ask, don't tell. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things you're doing right here, you're asking questions. Maybe you're asking them to yourself, but you're asking your, you are asking yourself a lot of questions that yep. I think most people, what I, my experience has been, most people don't ask enough questions. 
And uh, yeah. I always give a shout out to Mr. Harshberger. He was my eighth grade history teacher. And he said, <laughs> you have two ears and one mouth, use them proportionally. And yeah. like that really stuck Super with me. Important. So if there's any eighth grade teachers around that maybe you never know what comments you make. That uh, are sticking. Because there's one right over there. Um, I taught eighth so, grade too. What's that? I taught a lot of eighth grade too. Oh, did you? Yeah. Well, that's what I Natalie that teaches age. as well. And, and she actually teaches one of my children. But uh, anyway, uh, we'll leave that for another podcast. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where I was going, Dana, but that's okay. Uh, so anyway, I'll go to the next question. Is sure. I talked to every single one of these. Uh, this is the 140. 8th, 148th uh, person I've had the privilege to interview. Wow. And you, you know, you learn so much from people about so many different things. But the one thing I'm, I'm driven by for some reason, which is not right or wrong, I guess, but is fear, right? I'm always have this fear that like our entire firm is going to leave and our entire, you know, every client we have is going to leave mm-hmm. and it, it drives me and consumes me. Now that's also helped make me successful over the years, right? right. But it also can hinder you over, over time. Right. How many of the fears you put in your mind over your lifetime have actually blown up to the magnitude you put them in your mind to be? Mm. I would say, I would say there's a probably like, I don't know why I'm just hearing 20% and I don't know why. (laughs) So I'm just going to go with that intuitive answer. I do think, okay, so fear is an energy that is creative. Love is an energy that is creative, right? Both can create. Fear is really a powerful creator. So if we're thinking about fear, thinking about fear, thinking about fear and what we're afraid of, we can actually create that. So it's why we have, I think, the gift of time. So we'd like to be instant creators sometimes. Right? We like to go, oh, I'd like to create a million dollars. Oh, I'd like to you know, create a brand new house. Oh, I'd like to create a, a cool company, whatever it is. Well, it doesn't happen right off the bat. Why? Because we're also having thoughts in there that are like, ooh, if I'm trapped in a dark stairwell with a scary person, could something bad happen to me? Ooh, I'm on my way to my car at night. Am I thinking about being mugged? Am I having to be careful? Ooh, what if my house catches on fire while I'm gone? You know, those things could instantly create. We are powerful enough to achieve that, but we are dangerous currently as humans because we have so much fear. And I really think when we look at spiritual progression, what we're being asked as humans to do is to step more into unconditional love, which is the total absence of fear. Yeah. And I think too, I would almost not to challenge you, but I think I wonder how many of your actual fears have truly blown up though to like, you know, like my fears, the things I put in my mind have never actually happened to the level I've put them in my mind. Right. They just, they don't, they don't actually ever get that. They don't ever, yeah, they never come that big. And even the things that I, that I, didn't even think about when bad things happen. My, my outcome wasn't as bad as what I thought may happen. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Well, and I think that also speaks to not only how creative is our mind, right? How bad can we make the scenario, but also how resilient we are as humans, because anything that happens, we can heal. And one of the ways I like to walk people through healing in a, in a session when they're talking about fear and there's something that they're just like, paralyzed with fear is I go, okay, what's worst possible case scenario? And then we come up with that and we go, okay, if that happened, what would we do? Let's create a plan for it. And there's a plan for it. It's like, okay, now you can relax. You have a plan for your worst possible case. Now let's go back to practicality. Right. Yeah, that makes Mm -hmm. total sense. We just had a baseball player in here uh, yesterday, plays in the Milwaukee Brewers organization. And he works with a sports psychologist. And one of the things he said was, there's there's two paths your careers are going to go right and he goes let's talk about this path mm-hmm. you're you're going to get cut you're never going to play baseball again right worst case scenario deal with it right, right. and then be said but we're going to focus over here on this path and right. so it's exactly what you were saying and, and it's yeah. it's so true so and i think it loops back to what we were talking about at the beginning of like finding your passion i mean when i was like i'm going to give up everything i've ever worked for and and i don't have a thing left to my name i was I didn't know where it was going. Worst case scenario was I would be teaching somewhere again, you know, right. worst case scenario was I would be just serving drinks at a bar and, right. and that's not that bad to be no. fair. So it was like, okay, that's, I can deal with that. Now I can just see what may open up for me, which has yep. been much bigger than I could ever have imagined. Yep. Mm-hmm. Do you believe though that people, um, I don't know why I thought about this, but I've heard before luxuries once tasted becomes necessities. So luxuries once tasted become necessities. So I think if you were super uber successful and maybe you were, maybe you weren't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. 
is it harder for somebody that has tasted a certain luxury? And I don't mean luxury like a certain hotel or a certain car. Yeah. I mean, whatever that thing is in your life that's important. To give up. To give up, right? Yeah. I think it can be. I think it depends on the constitution of the person. See, I grew up, like I mentioned earlier, I grew up really poor. And so for me to have like, oh, no, you're not going to have a nice car. Or you're not going to have the house that you love or you're not going to. I was like, it didn't matter. I've been there before. It doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. So I think it's. It's if we have experienced something before and we know it's not that bad, it gives us that, that you know, sort of place to breathe to, to make that change. But I also think there are things that we taste, luxuries that we taste, that we go, wow, I don't really want to have to give that up again. So I'll work to make sure I keep that. Right. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So what would you look back and if you could tell Dana Child something 10 years ago or 15 years ago, what would you mm -hmm. tell that Dana? 10 years ago, <laughs> 10 years ago, I was, I was fumbling my way around India, right? <laughs> and so I think what I would have said 10 years ago was the practical, which is um, take care of your body because there are lots of things you can swallow in India that aren't good for you. Mm. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, Still paying that price, right? <laughs> right? So I would give myself that information. I think I would also just really reassure that there's there's the connection I didn't have ten years ago that I'm I'm developing every day now is that connection to source, you know, whatever you want to call it, be it the universe or stars or or you know God or Buddha or Allah or whatever word feels good. That connection that is consistent, that is constant, that is in unconditional love and pure power is always present and it's just up to you know up to little dana 10 years ago to just keep walking that path and trusting her heart and moving forward that i think is the biggest so you know pay attention to your body <laughs> yep. and 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 pay attention to your heart so uh some fun questions we're going to go through here rapid fire okay. if i steal your phone fun. right now i'm going to take your phone from you and i'm going to delete okay. besides email because that's not as fun yeah. If there's one app I can't delete, what is it? Okay, this is the most horrific confession ever. <laughs> it is it is the Spotify. I just music. Spotify. I can't do without music. Okay. I love it. Mm -hmm. That's good. So if mm -hmm. you if I delete that, that's bad. It's it, yeah, it would break my heart. And how many uh how what what's your relationship with this little thing right here? Like what's that like? Is it are you addicted to your phone? Are you not addicted to your phone? Do you have like rules on say, your phone? What is it? I like to say no. I don't give myself rules on my phone. I, when I have my phone in my hand, I tend to be working. It's, yeah. I'm a 90% worker, 10%, well, like 0% player these days, but mostly right. it's work. I'm a little unbalanced, but I think it's a time period and I'll come out of it. But it's, I have a healthy relationship with my phone. If I go out and I don't want to take it, I don't take it. You know, but right now it's, it's, it's really work. That's why I have it. Or music. Got it. Uh, if you could have dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would that person be and why? Dead or alive? You know, oh, that's such a hard question. I'm so limited. I'm so limited. Actually, I you're mean, unlimited because they're dead or alive. But. I know, but it's one person. <laughs> I'm like, who do I well, choose? Well, it's your rules. We can, you can have a table of three if you want. That's fine. Oh, I'm stumped. I, you know what I what first comes to mind, my first answer, which is interesting, is whoever my next partner is, right? Like whoever that next person is that I'm romantically involved with, I'd like to just have dinner with them now. <laughs> I'd like to <laughs> fast forward. You really want that one to be the next one, right? I know, probably not. I mean, there's so many good ones. Like, you know, Gandhi would be cool. Mother yeah. Teresa would be a good conversation. Right. Um, there's yeah. a lot. There's a, lot. There's a lot. Christ, you know, if you consider yeah. him a living being, like that would be a good conversation yeah. I'd like to have. That's what he said yesterday. He said, he goes, I got a lot of questions for Jesus. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, definitely. True. That's mm -hmm. true. Um, I give you $10 million. You mm -hmm. can't pay off any debts. You can't invest it like, you know, with Visionary Wealth yeah, Advisors, right. shameless plug. Right. Um, you can't do those two things and you can't just give it away to charity. Okay. Oh man. Because those okay. are the three things you would go do. So really what would I buy? Well, that, or what would you impact? What would you impact? What would you buy? Uh, what, what, what difference in the world would you go out and make? With $10 million. The uh, first dollars. thing that comes to me is I would say I would, I would be more able to schools. Like I would want to do something for education. I would want to yep. put that money in there, create some programs that help schools, inner city. 
um, teachers, fund some stuff for teachers. I would want to do, I don't know why I'm feeling this would be exciting to do retreats for teachers where there's mindfulness and self-awareness, yep. resetting schools, maybe funding some public schools to help reset a different way. Yep. That would be a fun use of 10 million. I like it. Well, if you get that 10 million, let us know. We may have some, uh, some help with that. Cool. Um, so any ladies, any questions, anything just really coming out at you right now that we got to ask? They're like, yeah. Number, uh, number six is, uh, how is energy affected by personality concepts? Ooh. Or just you, personalities, just in general, right? How is your energy affected by personalities? It, oh, I largely. One too, I wanted to ask. Yeah, it's largely impacted by personality. I think when we get really, um, really connected into source and we start to leave behind ego. And let me see, you had asked about ego earlier and I didn't yeah. really touch it. I don't view ego as like this horrible thing we have to silence and, and cut off. I think that ego is important because ego gives us our individual purpose. Without ego, yeah. we can't tap into our individual, individual purpose, right? Our real identity. But I think once we do tap into that, like spiritual purpose for being, then it's about effacing, like letting the ego go and starting to drop the personality. And I think that's a real on our way to becoming more enlightened, which I don't know about yet, but it's, you know, it's a goal, I guess. Right. It's a, it's a goal. Makes sense. I have a question too, that, um, these are from these ladies as well, but how, how do you keep your positive energy when maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a family member, whatever it may be that somebody's listening to this driving down the road and, and they have this negative energy in their life. How do we stay positive? Um, during all of that madness? Boundaries. Boundaries. So what we've learned is when someone's negative or upset, we often learn to take it on or to help them. But, but I think there's a lot of power in being a witness. So I can <laughs> feel your negative mood. I can feel your negative energy. I'm going to be a witness. You can dump it out if you want to. I'm not taking it on. I'm going to just stay really, you know how as a parent you set the tone for your children so they yep. can be having a meltdown, but you know not to buy in because then it's going to be a disaster in the house. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. So, so then it's yeah, like the I've, same I've thing with colleagues with it's, we can hold that space. I had the other day, a uh, moving truck was bringing, dumping some furniture here, not dumping, bringing, right. Right. Bringing yeah. some furniture here. And they took a side road through the neighborhood and they pulled down my neighbor's power line because it was a huge truck. I met my neighbors that that's, day. That's negative energy. Yeah. They were really unhappy with me and they came sort of spewing. Right. And I just, because I knew how I felt and I knew who I was that really knowing yourself. And I just listened and I said, you know, I'm really sorry about that. And then she went on to bring up something 10 years ago, a tree that was planted at the bottom of the driveway. And now the neighbor couldn't see to back out and it should be cut down. And I've lived here three months, not five years. Right. And I said, well, I'm happy to, to trim that tree back, but I'm not going to cut it down. So it's like having the boundaries and being able to just witness where someone is, but not take it on. And then I, when I left that situation, I, I walked away with myself intact, who I was in my mood, not hers. Do you worry about what she thought of you? Um, no, I, I didn't because I knew enough to know how I felt and who I am. So when we really know who we are, we're less impacted by someone else's perspective because instead of going, oh, am I seen this way? Am I this way? It's, well, I know who I am. She must be in a place where she's not seeing who I am. This is who mm. she is. How, how someone sees us is who they are, not who we are. And being comfortable in your own skin. A hundred percent. Yep. So how do we as parents, uh, we all have a lot of children in, in here, actually. What yes. is there? Uh, 12, 11? 11 children between wow. these three ladies. Okay. Um, I'm the father of four of them. Um, mm -hmm. And so how, do, how, okay. yeah, how does a parent positively influence energy? And is that even possible? Do we with have kids? a role yeah, with, with our children? 100%. I think one is the mistake we make is that we should never, our kids don't need therapy or our kids don't need counseling. We, that means they're broken. So one is as parents, we think we're supposed to, we mistakenly think we're supposed to take care of every mood, never have them unhappy. And really, we're just supposed to give them the tools to help them figure out their moods, to have them the support, to give them the therapy or the counseling or the friend or the you know, mentor, advisor. We're supposed to provide that, but not caretake or protect them. So we have to see our children as these spiritual beings in themselves that have their own spiritual paths. We're not meant to walk it for them and protect them from every hurt. 
we're meant to make sure they have the tools to deal with whatever they feel. So I, I, my expectation is I'm going to be cured from this. When, when I ask this question, you're going to help me is okay. and we're going to help all the husbands out there that, that <laughs> okay. you know, no whether they're at home with the kids or not home with the kids is right. it seems like it's a guy thing. A lot of us guys, we talk about it is our, we just did this at baseball on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Asher, my five-year-old was a little frustrated and, so therefore I was frustrated. And then Julie's all like calm and asking him nice questions. And, and I'm like, I, I, how is that even possible? Like I'm, I'm frustrated. And one of the right. dads was like, Oh my gosh, she sounds, she sounds just like my wife. How does the dad come home? And you know, this has never happened, but like the, 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 the thought of their, you know, swinging from the chandeliers and they're, you know, wanting to jump off the couch and kill each other. How do we like find our Zen and, you know, stay calm and not, you know, want to lose our, stuff. Right. Yeah. So, well, I think there's a couple different sort of threads in here too. I'm sure their husbands don't do that. Everything. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure everyone comes in is very calm when they come home, but no, we have to remember the way men are made, right? Men are made with a lot of testosterone and they spend that testosterone. If we go back to caveman days they are out in the wild, they're spending that testosterone. They come back, they sit down, they stare at the fire to rebuild their testosterone. They need that time. So when men these days, no, women have estrogen. So they're like, I'm going to do 20 things at once. And I don't know why you're not doing 10 of them. (laughs) Right. So when men come home, women are multitasking, right. Dealing with everything. I'm not saying women don't work either because they're, they can be building testosterone too. When women have to reconnect into their own feminine hormones. But when men come home, having that, if they have a partner, making sure they have time and space to say, I need 10 minutes when I come home. Men have to self-care. Men are forgetting how to self-care and working it out with your partner and making sure she's on board, right? Because right, she's exactly. going to be like, now I need time because now you're home. Yeah. So women want to dump, men want, men need space. And then it becomes this clash. Yeah. So it's saying, if you can give me 30 minutes when I'm home to go for a run, to sit in the room and watch TV, to just vegetate, to you know, make sure that the kids are doing their homework or they're doing something else productive, just to have that time I can rebuild myself enough and my testosterone enough to really be there for you. And here's how then I'm going to support you. It's it's that. Yeah. So it's really taking, you need that time and space because otherwise your energy is not rebuilt and you'll be really frustrated before you even get 10 minutes in the door. But also on the flip side though, to respect your partner is when I come home and you know, it's, it'd be great to think I'm going to go upstairs and sing Kumbaya and and recharge my energy. But (laughs) because on the flip side, she's thinking something I've been dealing with these kids for the last three hours and trying to do all this homework and all this stuff. And Mm -hmm. she wants, like you said, to dump, right? So how Mm -hmm. do you, how do you deal with the, I need my yeah. time. She needs her time, but yeah. obviously well, we can't I, just let four kids loose. And I think, I think that's where there's great conversation that has to happen in partnership. And some days you may recognize like, okay, it's just going to be a hard day because I know today's the day where I'm going to get home and I'm going to be right on. So I need to make sure that that 10 minute, 20 minute, 30 minute commute, I'm rebuilding myself. I'm listening to something I want to listen to. I'm, I'm doing music. I'm listening to a podcast. I'm having silence. I'm really there and centered when I get home and, and walk through the door. And there are days when she's not going to have all her needs met. She's going to be like, okay, I just know that I'm on an extra 30 minutes, even when he's home. So it's working that out as a team to really create that environment and then looking and going, okay, is it, do we want to have a, a neighbor, a grown neighbor come over in like 30 minutes? Can you just give us that hour so that we both get our time and then we get to reconnect as a family? It's finding those solutions. There's always a solution. Anytime there's a problem or a discomfort, the solution comes in right beside it. But so often we're so over-focused on the problem, we're not hearing or seeing the solution. It's always yeah. there. Yeah. Well, I'd like to again thank our listeners for uh, setting to the Brett and Julie uh, therapy session here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, this has been awesome, Dana. And um, if, I know you have an online course, right? So you, yeah. uh, promote that a little bit because it's yeah, uh, amazing things that you're doing. Yeah, I have an online course that um, was developed for empaths, right, who really feel other people's emotions or maybe codependent and taking other people's emotions on or may who just you go out in public and you just feel overwhelmed by crowds. You're most likely an empath. If you're yeah. really emotional, people accuse you of being too sensitive or too moody. You're probably empathic. So it's a really quick course that allows someone to track through what's happening and why it's happening. And there's also information on parenting in there, how to parent an empath, as well as how to be a parent as an empath. 
those and how to do relationships as an empath that it's a clean course. It's a great course. I love it. I also teach around, um, coming up October 21st and 22nd, I'll be in New York teaching. Um, I have a nine month course that's going on right now. Wow. Um, that's already started, but there's always videos that can be caught up and that's really, it's really profound healing. Um, that's being offered and I'm always cooking up new stuff next year. I'll be doing a retreat. I'm not sure exactly where, although I'm thinking about Bali, but I like to do retreats that are geared toward oh. healing and partnerships too. That just, that just costs a lot of money for us. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> so where do our uh, listeners find more of that? And you got a website, you're on Instagram, all the social media. Tell us more about that. Yep. Dana child's intuitive.com is the website. Um, Dana, so Dana child's intuitive.com. Yep, that's the website. Dana Child's Intuitive is on Facebook, um, and Instagram is the is the most active you know account right now. Yep. Um, I think at some point I had a Twitter account. Maybe I'm there. <laughs> I get it. I, I, I just want to commend you too. I think it's amazing how you buy. You said in ten years ago, right? You're in a one way mm -hmm. ticket to India, and now yep. you are on, um, you know, a, a just a, a awesome launch pad of success, yeah. and you're helping so many people. So. Yeah. Uh, that's probably a whole nother episode that we could talk about of, of how do you do that and how do you help people. But congratulations for what you're doing. I Thank know you. these ladies might like to say hi once we uh, hit stop recording here. Sure. Unless they want to come say hi now. But uh, it's been awesome having you on the Circuit of Success. And thanks so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brett.